you for joining me on this edition of the Wholehearted Christian Sunday Sermon. And today we will begin a new series entitled The Attributes of God. So, as many of you know by now, I wrote this book, The Whole Counsel of God, Thinking Biblically About Christianity, as a way to introduce readers to the God of the Bible, um, to introduce better ideas of the God of the Bible uh, for some reinforcing uh, more accurate theology of the God of the Bible. Um, so, a few weeks we'll be going into this series, uh, each one talking about a different attribute of God. So, the intent is to grow closer to God in the better understanding of the knowledge of God, uh, knowing who God is, and understanding the purpose of having a relationship with Him, and what we can expect from God. Okay, so with that being said, I would like to say that no one knows everything about God. God has so many attributes, an infinite number of attributes. We could never begin to count. We could never begin to fully understand or fully grasp God. But what he has revealed to us in the Bible, I'll be going over a few of them, about eight of them. And like I said, I'll be taking my time doing one each week. Alright, so from this book, I'm going to read uh, Who is God? This is the introduction in my book. Alright, so the text here comes from Acts 17, verse 22 through 23. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. Alright. According to scripture, the Godhead is triune. The prefix tri equals three. And the word unity, meaning one, is where the term trinity comes from. Yet this word is not found in the scriptures. For that reason, many say wrongly that the trinity is not taught in the scriptures and is made up by pagan tradition. I, however, find that it is the work of the Holy Spirit that teaches us, John fourteen twenty six. Who God is through the scriptures, and that everyone outside of the spiritual realm misses that fact. John 1 5. The correct understanding of the Trinity is that there is one God that exists in three persons the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So throw away anything you have ever thought about God that is contrary to this fact. Because we must worship God in spirit and in truth. John 4.24 Despite any misinformation one may have, we must settle the fact in our mind. Because we don't want to worship the unknown God. As the Athenians did in our text. Instead, we should know full well who our God is so that our worship to him will be genuine. The Bible is clear that God the Father is eternally self-existent. Genesis 1.1 1, 1. That Jesus, God the Son, is eternally begotten by God the Father. John 1.1-18 1, 1 And that the Holy Spirit eternally proceeds from both the Father and the Son. John 15.26 All three persons of the triune Godhead were recorded in the creation of all things. Genesis 1 and John 1. They are three distinct persons, not manifestations or modes as some wrongly teach, 
or misinterpret with human rationale. Neither is Christ created or just a man. False religions even teach that Jesus is Michael the Archangel. Nor is the Holy Spirit just God's active power. False religions teach that the Holy Spirit is not a person, but an impersonal force. How there are three distinct persons, but one God will remain mysterious until we reach heaven. However, what we do know, we must rightly worship because the scriptures give us that much information. And with that, we boldly come before the throne of grace. We do very well to maintain a very high view of God because that is how we understand him. His characteristics are all throughout the scriptures, and I'll list some of them here to study on. Immutability. That means God never changes. Malachi 3 and 6. Hebrews 13 and 8. James 1 17. Omnipotence. God is all-powerful. Daniel 4.35. Isaiah 43.13. Matthew 19.26. Omnipresence. That means God is everywhere at all times. Jeremiah 23.24. Proverbs 15.3. Omniscience. God is all-knowing. 1 John 3.20. Psalm 139, verse 4. Psalm 147, verse 4. Hebrews 4, verse 13. And sovereignty. This means that God is in complete control of everything. Daniel 4, 35. Isaiah 45, 10. 46, 10. Excuse me. Psalm 135, 6. And Ephesians 1, 11. And today... Our attribute will be holiness. Now, mind you, I would like to point out that God is not one more attribute than the other. God is equally uh, holy as compared to loving. And he is equally as loving as he is wrathful or vengeful. He is equally as wrathful or vengeful as he is merciful. He is equally as merciful as he is sovereign. So there are, uh, as far as I can understand from scripture, there is no way to say, well, God is more loving than he is just. Or God is more this than he is that. God is equally all of these things. God is completely all of these things. God is perfectly well balanced. God is perfectly who he is. And he does not change. All right. So the first uh, attribute that we are going to deal with is holiness. God is holy. And, and as simple as I can put it, holiness is without sin. God is holy. He is completely sinless. There is no sin in him, word, deed, or thought. He does not allow sin anywhere around him. God doesn't deal with sin. God doesn't like sin. Sin stinks in his nostrils because God is holy. He is a holy God. Anything that is not righteous, anything that is not true, even like we like to say the little white lie, anything of that nature it disgusts God. He detests it. It makes him utterly angry. Why? Because he cannot deal with sin. He does not have any dealings with darkness. He does not have any dealings with lying. He doesn't have any dealings with deceit. He doesn't have any dealings with falsehood or, or, or wickedness or anything. God is holy. God is holy. Fully and completely. And so we want to learn a little more about understanding the holiness, the sinlessness, the absolute perfection that is God. 
And the scripture that we will read is Revelation chapter 4. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. After these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here. And I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately, I was in the spirit. And behold, a throne set in heaven. And one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne. In appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the throne I saw 24 elders sitting. Clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightning. Thunderings. And voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne. Which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So as we see here, this is a picture of heaven that John saw. He saw the elders in heaven. And, and these elders reigned with Christ. It said around the one throne that there were 24 other thrones. These are people who are reigning with Christ because the Bible tells us that we are joint heirs with Christ. So then when Christ rules in heaven, we rule with him. The white garments that they were wearing represents purity, holiness, because we have to be holy as God is holy. As Jesus is perfect and sinless, when we get to heaven, we will be perfect and sinless just like him. Now, I'm not saying we're going to be gods or we're on that level. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that where we're not able to live a sinless life here, as Jesus did, when we get there, there will be no sin because God is holy. Jesus is holy. Jesus is God. He is holy. And he cannot tolerate any sin, not the smallest form of sin around him because he is holy. He can't deal with sin. Sin cannot live in his presence. Sin cannot... Uh, Endure his presence because he is so holy and so awesome and so high. And then even the 24 elders who sat on the throne. Around the throne of Jesus Christ. Which this is a picture of. We see that even they got on their knees and worshipped him. And they cast their crowns. Meaning that our splendor when we get to heaven. As exalted as we will be in in, in as perfect as we will be 
and as in right of a standing as we will be with God, our righteousness even then will still pale in comparison to his. Our holiness even then will pale in comparison to his. They take their thrones and cast them off like nothing before his feet. We are not worthy, but you are. Because you are God and you are God alone. He is holy. He is perfect. He is everything that we could never be in this life or the next life. God has always been. He is. He always was. And he will forever be everything that we could never be. He is holy, completely, fully, perfectly, awesomely. And even in heaven, we will cast the, 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 the greatest one in heaven. We'll have to cast his crown at the feet of Jesus and bow the knee that he is Lord, that God is holy, that God is perfect, that God is sinless, that God is everything we could never be. You alone, God, are worthy. You alone are holy. The, the four living creatures with the six wings, the cherubim, they sit around the throne and all they do day and night is worship God holy, 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 holy are you Lord God Almighty, holy, holy, holy. We have to see God when we think of the lies, when we think of hiding things from God, when we think we're getting away with something, we have to understand that we approach a God who is holy, holy, holy. The only way we are righteous, the only way we are made right in God's sight is because someone who is holy had to go before us. That is why Jesus is our high priest. That is why you see the 24 elders casting their crowns at the feet of Jesus because even though we are joint heirs with Christ and we are able to come boldly before the throne of grace, we even still know our limitations even in our perfected state in heaven. There is still only one holy God and Jesus is it. He sits on that throne and, and, and we bow down and worship him because he is holy. He is sinless. He is perfect. There is nothing that we can do, say, or think to understand the perfection that is Jesus Christ, the perfection, the splendor, the glory that belongs to Jesus Christ, the holiness, the complete sinlessness that is Jesus Christ. We can't understand it because all we understand is sin. We were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Jesus was not. Jesus never knew sin and sin never knew him, yet he paid the price for our sin. He bore our sins on the cross, all who would believe. Because he is holy and his sacrifice to the father was holy. And because he was resurrected, that was God saying, I am satisfied with the sacrifice. No more do we have to kill and slaughter lambs and goats and whatever else to sacrifice because Jesus was the one and only perfect, holy, holy, holy sacrifice to God once and for all for sins past, present, and future. Jesus did all the work already. He is holy, holy, holy. The smallest way that we can understand, the fraction of the understanding that we can have of the holiness of God, we would tremble we should tremble in fear thinking wow i i told a lie we can't even think about lying without trembling shaking in your boots because we understand that one day we have to stand before a holy 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 god not only then but even now that when i tell a little a little lie when i try to hide a little thing god sees it and he is holy 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 and he doesn't like it so then we are conforming to the image of Christ when we think, oh my God, he is watching me. I just messed up. Lord, forgive me. Because we just that much understand that I am forever in the presence of a holy, holy, holy God. I can't hide anything from him. He knows me inside and out. He knows my thoughts. He knows my 
intentions. He knows everything about me. I can't hide anything from him. Lord, I am a wretch undone. Lord, save me. And because we know that we can't do it, and because we know that our righteousness is as filthy rags in his sight, then we know that God is holy, holy, holy. And then we come boldly, confidently before the throne of grace. Why? Not because we're all big and bad, but because our high priest went first and, and made the way. Our high priest went first and paved the way. Our high priest went first, first and opened the doors for us to enter to the Father boldly and ask for whatever it is we need. Ask for forgiveness. Ask for his mercy. Ask for his grace. Because the holy, holy, holy son of God paid the price for us. He is holy. Be ye holy for God is holy. 